to the Johnny Drinks Podcast. I am your host today. This is John. I'm joined by my son. I John. guess I'm not your co-host. You're the host now. I'm the host. Well, okay. maybe I should. Well, then, would well, you mind well, leaving well, for a few minutes? I talked to my friend Anthony Martin. I'll sit back. All right. So we are joined here today by a friend of mine who is more than a friend. He has accomplished a lot. And we're going to share some pretty cool stuff. Um, let him tell some of his story, some of the things that have... Um, I think as, a, as an adult, you learn along the path um, of growing and some of the pains and some of the more exciting things that we like to celebrate in life. Um, my son, John, is here, obviously. That's Johnny. He's our, I'll let him be the co-host today. Thank God. Yeah. So we got this little dynamic going. Um, but I want to just jump right in because uh, Anthony drove all the way in from Wayne, New Jersey, mm. and Let's start with how how did your day start this morning? Well, <laughs> I try to tell my son all the time that if you're not 15 minutes early, you're late. <laughs> and uh, luckily today, I, I I actually practiced that. So I actually tried to come here a half hour early, and I wound up being 15 minutes late because when I walked out to get in my car, I look at it and it's flat and it's a huge nail in the car. Oh! So luckily, I didn't try to time this right because I would probably have been an hour late. And um, I immediately texted John and I said, I got a little problem here and I'm probably going to make it on time. But, you know, uh, anyway, it worked out. I got through it. I got here only a couple minutes late. And uh, and that's a good point because you should always prepare and plan for the right? worst, <laughs> plan for the worst and expect the best. Yes. So because, again, what was otherwise going to set us off, all of us, our whole day would, would have probably been much different. Um, that would have taken an hour extra you were prepared and kind of here we ended up maybe only 15 minutes late no big deal cool well i'm glad you made it here okay and um i do want to again talk about a lot of different things with you i want to give a little bit of background you are multi-talented you've started in a, an industry in the music industry i guess just kind of you know teetering around you've done that a long time you've uh um had a band yes and years. you've actually, yeah, and then had a profession. It was always a side thing. Always a side thing. I'm not to suggest he was a headliner. I by wanted to means. be a rock star, but you know, had that, and how that work out? <laughs> yeah. You know, maybe in other ways, uh, uh, it, it panned out in other ways. So yeah, it was yeah. always there, though. No. Well, there's always something to yeah. spring. I met my wife because of it. So oh, there I mean, you go. Like, I mean, if that's not. There you go. Word. Something it's else amazing. comes from There's it, no springboards into something forward. Um, and so you have your full-time um, livelihood career, which is in the advertising space. But I, I definitely want to touch on all of that. I also want to dig into the fact that you made a movie. And there's not a lot of people I know that actually come up with an idea with some friends, let's say, and you're going to expand on it. And then actually follow through with it and create a movie that you could go and search for on what, like Netflix, on all the platforms? On, on, the, on most of the pla Apple, uh, iTunes, and right. Amazon. And, and it's there. Lionsgate I, put it out. Really? So, wow. What's it called? It's a real movie. My Man is a Loser. Wow. <laughs> no, sorry, Anthony. <laughs> That's hands. so interesting. When, when was this? Uh, 2015. So um, oh, we're going to get right into this. Yeah, right, I was going to say, right, get, right, get, right into, right into it. Get right into so, it. Bring us, uh, bring us back. You, you, we've all done this, where you're sitting with friends, and you're laughing and joking around about something. I'm like, ha oh, we should make a movie. We actually, like, did it. <laughs> so we were uh, sitting around just talking about life and, you know, job and marriage. And, you know, you're married a lot of years. And, uh, you know, marriage is tough, right? There's ups and downs. And we we're all talking about, you know, how there's times where our wives love us and our wives hate us. So um, we started telling these funny stories about marriage and like we should make a movie. So, you know, it was one of those comments we all make and that never happens. And there had to be alcohol involved. I'm <laughs> of, sure. course, of course. Right. Um, <clears throat> but two, two of the, uh, my friends who were, who were uh, there were actually came back a couple of days later like, I think we're going to make a movie. And they did most of the, the hard work where, you know, they came up with the idea, they contacted, 
and outsourced to, to, to some players where we got some interest and they went through all the steps. They actually did a thing, on a, it was called um, 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 there was a website that, that you could go on, uh, Extra Normal I think it was called, where you go on and you can type content in and it's two cartoon characters talking to each other. So they so like kind of animation, like animation, that plays like, it, it, was out a, for you? it was a husband and wife, and oh. it's like animated. And mm-hmm. you just put the content in, and it just speaks. Okay, and it's just these little shorts. Okay, and what they did was uh, they had the husband coming home from a work industry event, which we might get to later sure. about the industry events that right. I have in advertising, where you just live in fantasy land, where you're like somewhere in the world, and you know it's very glitzy, and then you come home back to reality. But in this little short, what he's thinking is what he's actually saying. And she's like, you know, you know, she comes, he comes in and, you know, she hands him the baby and go throw out the garbage. And he's like, I was just, you know, on, I was on just top of a table with champagne and con on a yacht, you know, like, and he's thinking <laughs> what he's saying. And I get into this argument. Anyway, I think got like a hundred thousand views. Hmm. And, wow. um, and one thing led to another where, um, someone who was involved in entourage, remember entourage, that great mm-hmm. show saw it. And this whole concept of like, can we make a movie? They have some content. The person from Entourage contacted them and like, oh, you should make another one of these shorts. And they're like, actually, we were thinking about making a movie. And we got connected to some people uh, who worked on that production side. And we hired a, a script writer. So we came up with the money. So we all, the friends came up, we all chipped in. And we came up with a script. And the script was based on stories of us. They, he, they'd interview us and like, well, tell me a story, a funny story about an argument you had with your wife or a situation where, you know, something happened. Where, and then he put it all together and we made this movie. So, constant- so wait, let's, let's, let's talk timetable here. Okay. From, from the concept, the hanging out, whether you, did you really have cocktails? You were hanging out drinking? Yes, hanging, hanging, hanging out, out drinking. So, you know, so let's make hang- a movie. And then this was, and this happened around the same time. And like, we actually can make a movie. <laughs> so and we when, have an what idea that's that? actually people are interested in. What year is that? The think tank like started. 20, late 2013. All right, so 2013. 2015 is when the movie came. You guys out. have this epiphany of a brainstorm idea. And from there, you seriously and, and consider it's my it. two friends eric bamberger david gullen they would want to do all the work you know we were we were part of the group and said all right we'll we'll throw you in money fund it. Right. and uh we'll do it all right i so wanted to being in the movie at the end uh, me and michael rapaport get i have michael rapaport in the headlock no right. way right but hold on let's let, let's not give up the whole thing here <laughs> okay. because there's so much there is so much that is needs to be shared and told about this and i want those who are listening to understand this timetable right things number one Everything takes time. Everything takes money. Everything takes a commitment and a depth of of level of seeing things through. So 2013, you have the idea. You get the screen, you get the ideas and you go to a a screenwriter, someone to write out the script. Okay. So what year was that or how long did it take from the idea to get the the script? Probably a year before. I mean, I'm trying to think back now. I would say 20, probably 2014, a year before, you know, so, you know, versions of the script came through Mm -hmm. and we kept on looking at them. And then we actually didn't know if we were actually going to make the movie until we saw the script because we just invested in someone writing a script. Sure. Which wasn't cheap, by the way. Oh, that, that, so that's the point. So now you now you have a script. It costs money. Yeah. And now the reality of it becomes, well, we have to pay for this, right? Yeah. So walk through and some of that. And there's two ways that. to actually make a movie. You can make the movie, finish it on your own, and then go and sell it to the uh, distributors. Okay. Or you can have an idea and have the distributors invest in it. Much that's harder to do, especially, if, you know. New guys on the block like us, you know, it's it's hard. We're going to go pitching, you know, you know, Buena Vista and Lionsgate, and you know, they weren't going to invest in it, right? So we came up with the money, we hired the talent, everybody. You know, one thing, one thing just leads to another. You meet someone who knows this person, who knows that person, and everything kind of just comes together, and that's the process we went. We made the movie first, and then went out and sold it. But um, as the script changes were coming in, we finally got to the point where like this is pretty funny. And I had other people read it. I'm like, let's do it. Let's go. I don't know how much. We, how much is the budget? You know, what do we need? And um, we all pretty much um, put up all the money for the movie. Um, how much? A group of us. How much is? It? I think it was around four million. Okay, four million dollars yeah. to carve out and make your own movie, and yeah. then go to the production studios, right, oh, yeah. or the studios to actually buy it, distribute it, or distribute it. Okay. Yeah. 
Right. Did you have an There's idea different of, ways to do it. Yeah. Did you have an idea of how much money this could make you? Well, I kept on thinking, like, if it was $4 million and I put in a chunk of that, all you have to do is, you know, I see these movies by other, like, you know, Adam Sandler had some great movies, had some bombs, and the bombs, you know, do $20 million in the box. So I'm like, okay, wait. If we can do five, six times what our investment yeah. is, you know, after paying out everybody, maybe we double or triple our money. Great investment. Mm. Yeah. So that was kind of the idea that went into it, you know. But the more money you spend, you're risking on your your return on investment. So, and we had to make conscious decisions where at first it was three million, and it was three and a half, and it's four. Do you go to six? Do you go to seven? You right. know. Well, I would think as as you have to cut at some point, you know. And the, the only problem was is that we were all like it was a wild wild west. We really didn't know what the hell we were doing. Mm -hmm. You know, we had funny ideas and we had some people in there, but ultimately we were the decision makers. And you have you know, 50 people telling you to do something different and you have to make up your mind. In hindsight, we made a lot of mistakes. Sure. You know, mm. but. So I would think as you carve out a budget after you have the script, why the number keeps going up has a lot to do with who you're going to cast. Yeah. Who, who, who you're, who you're going to give the script to to read and then in turn pay them yep. to be a star in the show. So why don't you share who you had as the star Supporting yeah. cast. Well, let me tell you a little bit about the movie, and then okay, you know, you'll see how the cast okay. actually fell into the right place. So, like I said, you know, so the, the movie was about married guys trying to sell their internet company, mm -hmm. Ringo Bell, mm -hmm. as, as we later talk. And um, you know how, and married people can 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 uh, relate to this is that you know when you first meet your spouse, you're the coolest thing in their eyes. You are, you know, like. You're amazing. There's nothing you can do wrong. And as time goes on, it's just natural. Our kids come and life comes and you're not as cool and you might not be as special as you once were because, you know, that's that's what happens. Especially you go down to me being, you know, me and my friends, like we've gone down to pecking order. It's like, you know, you know daughter, son, dog, sure. yeah. you know, husband. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, the idea was uh, in the movie where uh, these guys want to really... Um, get back that their wives fall in love with them again okay and they have one friend who is still single who was the coolest he dressed cool he looked cool women loved him he was spontaneous he was and these guys just lost their way they weren't they weren't the guys they once were but he was going to teach them to be the guys they once were and oh. be cool again so their wives fall back in love with them that was the idea of the movie that was the idea of the movie that's sick Sounds so, like a good idea who do you get to play that single guy that cool older single guy who has the look and everything we got the perfect actor. This is what I thought. Like, this is going to be amazing. John, John Stamos. Stamos. No. I mean, like. <laughs> Wait, I swear to God, I didn't know that. I, really? On my life, that was me guessing. Really? Who you, I swear to oh, God. That's amazing. Wow. I, I'm blown. Wow. Because you didn't even know anything John about the movie. Stamos. On my know, life, that was, a that was totally a straight up guess right now. Yeah. You didn't know that. Swear to God. Well, I guess you did your research before the podcast then, huh? That is insane. Wow. We're just we're right here, man. That is. That's I mean, could you think of a better no. person to play that no, role? No, you really couldn't. I mean, he's got a following. You know, he's, he's, a, he's a well known actor. He's, you know, great looking. Even sure. the person at dinner with the guy, he's just, you know. I, I mean, meaning, you know, listen, that's 2014. Today, he's still very relevant, yeah, yeah. right? So think about what his height then, then as it is now. So how do you, you have a, Wow, great wow. leading role actor in John Stamos, and it still fails. It doesn't do well. <laughs> it sucks. And like, talk talk about some of the support. Oh, yeah, yeah, way to ruin the surprise. Yeah. Well, it failed in uh, some ways, but it was a success in others. So, uh, so then the married guys, you know, the guys who are part of the movie, uh, Michael Rappaport, just funny, mm. great actor, right? Um, just just all around, it was perfect for the role. And then Brian Callen, which you may know, he's a comedian. He was yeah. in a bunch of the Hangover movies, he's, and he's, he's all great. over the place. He's great. He has I mean, a podcast amazing. too. Yeah. And then Tika Sumter, who was up and coming then, and she's done. She's gone on to a lot of other roles. Um, she was um, you know, one of the stars in the movie as well. And as we had all these other, you know, we had like live live newscasts where like Maria Bartiroma, she did a thing on like you know the the inter internet industry, and then we just flashed to her for a second at the time, and we did. Um, uh, Susie Orman, uh, you know, advice on, yeah. you know, like, and she was in it. Wow. She did a cameo. We had um, um, uh, Ronnie the Limo Driver from Howard Stern. Yeah, you <laughs> had some pretty it. big. So you know, and then Howard Stern started talking about it. There was a little buzz. You know, we figured, you know, we had we had all the right pieces. Yeah. Um, 
the problem is, is that, you know, you have the script and at first you get it and it's, you know, funny, raunchy in a good way. And then you're like, okay, let's lighten it up a little bit. Let's make it more you know, palatable to a, a wider audience. You start listening to people and you start making edits and maybe it wasn't as funny as it first was, right? We had more of like an old school, um, you know, those, those movie old school where like that kind of vibe into it and it kind of made it more like, well, let's, let's, let's appeal to you know, like, you know, all audiences. So you guys started changed, just the males, you know? So you changed off your instinctful direction because of who? Producers or people that you... Everyone, a lot of people telling you like, you know, let's, let's just have a wider audience. You can, you can make more money. You can have more of an appeal. You know, if you soften it up a little bit, you have, you know, instead of it all coming from an angle of a bunch of dudes, like let's, and you, you know, start making cuts and, and you start, and anything, when you start making cuts, sometimes it chops up things where you, you know, it doesn't flow as well. That gets to the point where do you invest more money? Now we're, we're filming it. And it's like, well, we, since we took out these parts, we need to connect the story better. Do we invest more money into it? And we actually did. Three months later, we had the crew back in, come back in and kind of fill in some gaps. And um, look, I think the money, the movie is f- funny. Like there are very funny scenes in this movie where it's, it's completely worth your time watching it. You know, you're not going for the drama of the story. You know what I mean? From this movie, you, you, it's quick laughs. You know, it's the it's it's that, and it definitely has that. The problem we ran into in the end is so you get to you go to the to the distributor portion of it, and there's lots of deals you can make where. You know, you get a bigger cut, uh, or you get less of a cut, depending on, um, you know, if you want more money up front, more money on the back end, and uh, lesser known distributors were offering more aggressive deals. But we went with Lionsgate, figuring it's Lionsgate. Really? I mean, Lionsgate wow. serious, right? But we gave up the farm to go to Lionsgate. But we figured, okay, they'll get paid, they'll make their money, and then if it does well, you know, it's Lionsgate. It's going to give us serious credibility. Well, what we learn is a lot of these studios, they have to check the boxes, right? Yeah. You know, put out a certain amount of movies a year. And the movie became a, a tree that fell in the forest. No one really knew about it. If it just got its due, people would have watched it just for the actors, just for watching Rappaport and Stamos. Maybe we could rejuvenate it. And Brian from- and Tico Sumter. Yeah. Just for that alone. Um, you know, there was a few, like, you know, uh, Stamos went on Kimmel. He did go on Good Morning America, and Rappaport did a few things, and Howard Stern mentioned it, but it wasn't enough. Like there wasn't a wide distribution, you know, uh, and it kind of just petered out. So, but it was an amazing experience. I got to meet amazing people. Um, you know, it was uh, just the learning the process sure. and everything. You know, it's uh, you know, so you know, we didn't make money. You know, at the end, the movie should have been called "My Producers Are Losers" because we didn't make any money. <laughs> but uh, as far as the the movie, I'm very I'm pretty proud of it. I think it's funny, and uh, there's some there's some really great scenes in it. We're gonna so have to watch it. To watch. Maybe if, maybe we can, like I said, rejuvenate it, bring it back to life, and who knows? Maybe it comes out of the well, so now where, where, yeah. where does it right? Could be one. Of the, I always thought it could be a cult movie. In yeah, one day. maybe. You know, where does it stream now? Still Netflix. It's on uh, Apple, uh, I guess iTunes, Amazon um, Prime. You can pull it up. Oh, there. So I was gonna say, we're just type in out. "My Man Is a Loser." You'll see the trailer come up, and <laughs> I have an IMDb. So in in the end scene, there's a there's a there's a there's a fight at the end, and like I said, Michael Rappaport and I get into a little 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 yeah. Uh, you had, you had a, a cameo. We call it a cameo, right? So in the IMDb, IMDb it says Anthony Martinelli, big goon and bar um, and producer. That's awesome. <laughs> Wow, so this says it's uh, available on Vudu Plex YouTube for four dollars. What's the wrong Google tomatoes? Play, Apple Score. TV? Yeah, I, I, yeah. I don't remember, but it, it was below fifty percent. Oh. Um, you know, but yeah, what's that say? Watch, watch the trailer. The trailer. Twenty-four percent. The, the trailer is great. It is great. I started watching it, yeah, and I got to tell you, I started my watching wife, it. My right before, it, and they, these guys improv so much. You know, uh, mm. you know, what did you, my wife thinks I smell like mushrooms when I, you know, I go to bed and this, this, you know, there was a scene where, uh, they talk about Amex sex where, where the, the wives are walking, they're, they're doing their morning walk and they're like, you know, I, you know, I bought, you know, I bought shoes and I bought a thing and, oh. you know, and, <laughs> and my husband gets the bill, the bill, but I make sure to time the bill with Amex sex. Oh, that's, so then that, <laughs> that's it's very funny. funny. I saw that scene. Yeah. I, I watched, I tried to watch it uh, a couple of years oh, ago yeah, when you that. first introduced it to me. Yeah. Um, and I just got, I don't know, I forget what happened. I never got to the end of it, but all right, I'm going to have to go back. I'm going to revisit this. We do may you, have to. 
have a resurgence here. In it. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. do you still make royalty on like, how does it work per watch? Uh, well, Lionsgate has to make their amount and then we get, we, you know, so it's process. Same, same <laughs> so they same. haven't made their amount. We yet. need a, maybe, maybe this will be the breakthrough. This podcast Who knows? to get a, a little cult Could. following to watch Could. this movie. All right, it would be great. It'd but be so they have to make their money. They haven't made their money back yet. Mine's Not right. fully. Okay, so we have to wait for that. Again, first. a tree that fell in the forest. Literally, a tree that fell in the forest. Mm. So that's what I mean. No one's ever heard of it um, outside yeah. your your group and a small percentage of people, I guess that yep. you know took a peek at it. And that's where we went wrong. We should have went for taking a less of a cut mm. and uh, getting a distributor who was going to actually really promote it. And in the long run, we would have came out with more. If instead, we we're like, okay, you guys have full control. You do everything, you know, give us more of a cut, but they had to make their money first. Well, that's a good lesson. Listen, yeah. that that's why, again, part of sharing this story is in no way, shape or form to embarrass, right? To say, well, it failed. It didn't do well. Well, if you made a heavy investment, millions of dollars, and you didn't get money back, it's safe to say that was not successful, right? And if- in Chalk the, it up as a loss. Chalk but it up as a loss. There's only more wins than losses in life. But that's right. And so to that point is the, the lessons that you've learned. And if someone else was listening to this or someone else was to come to you and say, oh, I got this great idea. I want to make a movie. You'd be like, okay, hold on. Here's what you want to consider. And, and and one takeaway right out of the gate there is um, who you are going to have uh, distributed, right? Rather than going big, maybe go smaller, less of a piece um, of, of your, your stock interest in it. So that's really interesting. And, and, and uh, thanks for like sharing that. But yeah. um, it, it was an amazing experience. I, I wouldn't trade, you know, again, you have to take risk in life to be successful. You have to. I mean, right. that's... The name of the game well, you have to be willing to take the risk and know what your risk is and if you're you can accept your risk you know you're not gonna at the end of the day you're not gonna look at it as a total loss because you knew what you were getting into right. and you know what we're gonna talk to anthony more about that because he knows what it is to take risk he knows what it is to have benefited by some of the risk and also the flip side of that but i want to take a break and just come back and then we're going to share a little bit more of what anthony's successes are a few moments later and we're back so would you would you make a movie again it's a great question um i, I would never want to say never but um it's a tough business i mean there are movies out there that are phenomenal right. that don't make you know it's just like you know you're lucky to draw i mean think about these movies that became cult classics later where they made literally nothing when they came out you know um it's 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 a big risk and uh, I would only make a movie in the future if we had some guarantees. Um, because, and you need to have the leeway to actually make the changes too. That's what we, you know, we didn't have. We had our little cap here and like, okay, we hit the ceiling. Had we made some more changes too, I think it would have been, it would have come out a lot better. But all those changes have a, a denomination yes, of exactly. money to connect You need to, to factor it right. in the beginning. Right. I was going to ask you, know? like, what would you, what would be the difference if you started another movie today? How, what would you do differently? I would stick to our gut. The original idea where it excited people, we shouldn't have we, we shouldn't have strayed from that. Yeah. That would be number one. Number two is, you know, the whole uh distributor being smarter about that. They're gonna look at the future. Um but you know, a lot of things we did right. We had the right actors, you know, we had the right writer. Um uh, I thought the story was great, you know. Is there any like again, you were kind of joking about like this podcast having the resurging uh factor and, and driving and i wasn't views. planning on this by the yeah way. but listen but, but you never know I, just so you know i don't even know i didn't i walked in here not even knowing a thing what we were going to talk about that's well, why i really like it Keep that, it yeah listen, seriously you never know what could happen but is there like a plan approach that you can take to let's say if you said right now you want to give it another go with this movie do you reach out to people for additional promotion or how does that work honestly um i was the money part of it yeah, you know what I mean, and and uh, our, our two my two very good friends who were the principals, they were more knee deep, and they would come back to us and say, "Look, here are our options. Here are what we do." But they were the ones that were actually doing all the negotiation, and we were just working it, you yeah. know, outside of it. So, um, you know, uh, doing it again, though, you know, I, again, stick to your laurels, stick to the, to the idea that got you there in the first place, and I think when you listen to all these people, and it's just like look at these these huge movies, they just that with 
multi, you know, hundreds of million dollar budgets fail, right? Because mm-hmm. everybody has their input. Just stick to your gut, I think. And I think at the end of the day, if you fail knowing you stuck to your gut, I think you're, you feel better. And then listening to everybody else and then failing, you know, it's like, why did I listen? You know, at least, right. you know, fall on your own sword. Hmm. Interesting. How was John Stamos as a person? <laughs> he was awesome. Really? And, you know, casting too. We met a lot of other actors. We met a bunch of the actors from Entourage. Um, oh, that's sick. You know, the guy who played Turtle. Uh, really? And the, um, uh, what was the uh, woman there with the girlfriend? Um, uh, Samo, Samo, I can't Samo help you. Samo, is can't Samo help you. I forget. Anyway, we met. They were great. We had some really great uh, dinners and stuff. You know, you have this courting at this point because we actually weren't paying them. We were going to give them, you know, a cut of the, of the movie. So you can, uh, they're courting us because they wanted, you know, they thought it was, was a great script, funny script. And then at the same time, you know, on the reciprocal. But John Stamos was so awesome to hang out with, a real guy. And he would just tell these stories. And <laughs> it was crazy. Like, he's a music guy. I don't know if you realize this, but he's drummed for the Beach Boys. You know, he's a big music guy. Uh, even on Full House, you see a lot of yeah, episodes he where he's drumming. But anyway, he's a big music guy. And I'm a big music guy. And we started talking about music. And But he would just be like, yeah, Springsteen was over last week. And with a couple, and we were jamming him. I'm like, what? <laughs> That's awesome. you and Bruce were just jamming you know I'm like I'm sitting with a guy at dinner just telling me like I, he jammed with Bruce Springsteen I'm like you just you know kind of like it takes you to another uh, a level of like wow I can't believe how close I am to like these mega stars but he was just this down to earth guy and at the time he was he he I was showing him pictures of my family and he's like you know I really want a family one day I haven't found the right girl and I'm happy now that you see all he's he's found you know, he's got a family and, you know, and everything. And he was a real genuine guy. I, I, I loved him. And uh, we've taken, we took walks around the, the street where Mercer, you mentioned Mercer Street. He was mentioning Mercer Street um, before. Um, that's one of the streets we filmed on. We, we actually blocked it off. And I remember taking a walk and uh, he was just telling me about, talking about life and he's a cool guy. My that's wife awesome. fell in love with him the second she saw oh, him. <laughs> Shocker. It was like, uh, you know, can I take my picture with him? <laughs> <laughs> you stay in touch with him still or no? No. Uh, some of the guys, uh, the guys, the two principals uh, do though. Cool. Yeah, I've seen uh, Brown Callen uh, since we had dinner a bunch of times. Oh, you did? Yeah. Oh, he's awesome great, too. Great, great guy. He's hilarious. Yeah. So you have been with the same job that you were prior to this movie, right? Nothing changed? No, I... I've same been the same, same industry, group, same, same industry. industry, and the same group of guys for uh, over twenty years. Which wow, is amazing! You know, same core group, and we've bought companies and sold companies and got acquired and spun off, and it's the same core of uh, of guys that I've been with, and and the same guys who actually were investors in the movie. Oh, you went. Oh, you went to them first. No, that's these are the guys that we were hanging oh, out with. Got and it. Cool. Came up with the idea. It's my. My my coworkers, my business partners, my best friends. Oh, that's so. interesting. So, what what is the what's the company you're with right now? Company's called Zeta Global, and uh, large company now, uh, over fifteen hundred employees. We're we're public. Uh, we just had an amazing earnings release. Um, you know, for in layman's terms, what we do is we uh, use AI and Martech to connect um, brands with the. Uh, right consumer at the right time through behavioral target. That's part of our business. And then we have an email business and a CRM business. Um, there's different businesses. I'm on the um, what's called programmatic side, um, behavioral advertising. Um, and uh, it's, it's an amazing company. We have um, great people. You know, all through my career, I, I've never been happier working wow. anywhere, even when I own my own company. Um, you know, technology is great. People are great. Companies sure. really going forward. I couldn't be happier. Right. Yeah, I mean, David Steinberg. You know, we, we, should, we should get him on. Amazing entrepreneur. He's a great guy. You speak amazing highly of him person. all the time. Yeah. And to be honest, you know, when I came into the company, I didn't know what to expect. You know, I was kind of skeptical. I was with the same guys for you know, seventeen years. I said I might need a change here, and I'll give this a shot for a couple months. And I was almost planning on walking out the door the second I got in there. And once I met the people. And I saw the conviction and I saw where the company was going. I was kind of floored. I'm like, I'm going to stick around here. And I'm so happy I did. Um, So share with Johnny, though, too, because now while you have alignment with Zeta Global, David Steinberg, and the team that you've always, uh, the players that you've always been around, the 
team has changed, but the players remain the same, right? Yeah, I mean, we were we were a core that got acquired by by Zeta Global in 2019, um, and then the story goes back, go back to the mist of time, to and for me, it's you know, it's the 90s. So I started out in um, you, know, you graduate college, and like I'm sure you you got a bunch of friends do this. Like, what the hell am I gonna do? Like, you know, I went, I got this degree. <laughs> And sometimes you you think you know where you're going to go and you end up somewhere else. And I, you know, I had an economics major and I'm like, I'm going to go into finance. My brother was working on Wall Street, I, you know, and then, um, I had a friend who uh, was working in this advertising company and I'm like, why don't you give this a shot? You know, and I'm like, all right, I'll try this. And I walk in and I'm like, wow, this is a pretty glamorous kind of industry where, you know, uh, it was TV spot sales. Guys coming in their suits and they're taking out, you know, agency buyers to, you know, shows and you know, there's a whole thing going on and it's the whole entertainment factor. So I thought it was really cool and I was a smitten from day one. So I did that for a bunch of years and in this late 90s, this internet thing was happening. It's like people were like, wow, this could be the next level. And one thing led to another where I got an opportunity to go to this internet company called Mail.com and I was doing really great at the company I was at. I had a really promising career. I was young, you know, I was in my 20s, young, tw early 20s. And I was like, oh, wow. I, I think the internet thing could be a great thing. And at the time, you were crazy to go on the internet off of TV because people weren't making money. And I, the day I quit, they're like, how the hell are you going to make money in the internet? I'm like, what's the worst going to happen? I'll fail and come back? You know, like, so, you know, and then, you know, we all know the wave you know, this is off. like 1999. So think about wow. what was going on then. Um, but no one knew at the time. So what was going on then? Because a lot of young people listening don't understand that. <laughs> that was the... 98, 99, Google wasn't even Google. Right. Think about it. Facebook didn't exist. Yep. And it was the precursor to the Y2K technology pivot changing yeah. and the threat of yeah. the financial world, everything coming to an end. So there was a lot of emphasis at that time around technology Right. Yep. And things that you're talking about, the, the precursor to what is now just so easy to go Google and search and yep. and utilize the Internet. It yep. was not the case. Well, so we're you, on dial up. Then you, were, you, you were you were. You don't even know what dial up is like hit a keystroke and wait like a minute every time you hit a keystroke. I mean, that was like a blessing <laughs> that your computer just didn't lock up. Right. <laughs> dial up is a, a connect connectivity into the wall so a phone jack yeah, you're using a phone service yeah, yeah. yeah. so I mean, what were you was, doing at mail.com so mail.com was was a pretty cool idea uh it was like um it was the uh, gmail of the time so a uh, company was mail.com and they had all these affinity affinity uh email addresses where they owned like teacher.com or scientist.com or construction carpenter.com and so you could sign for an email account and be like johnny at you know um I love drinks. You were buying domains. They were setting yeah, up. buying domains, but that was your email address. Yes. This is kind of cool, right? And what we did was um, we would just sell the advertising that would go around. People would have a free account and someone has to be paid for somehow. So we would sell the advertising going around in the banners wow. on these email pages. And we would sell email distribution, you know, companies that wanted to reach people on an email. So that's what we did. And it, it was it was great. It was great business. But um, what happened was a uh, year and a half later, we got sold to a company called Netophone, which is owned by IDT. Netophone is a great synergy, had voice over IP. It was the Skype of, you know, 2000, 2001, okay? It was before Skype. But think about dial-up. <laughs> you you so think these online calls it sound like you were underwater. <laughs> but idea there is when you go on the uh, site, you make your call, and there were ads going there. So email video calls, good synergy. So we get acquired and that's why I met my business partners, Eric Bamberger, Will, Will Mark, all off of the two guys that mm -hmm. we did the movie with, who I'm still with today. And uh, we all worked together for a year and then the dot-com bubble burst. People may know about what happened at the time. The internet uh, was know. going like a, yeah. up like a rocket ship, but so fast that there were a lot of these bullshit companies there, you know, getting seed money and it created a bubble that burst. And IDT at the time looked at us and said, you know what, we're, we're, we're going to get out of this. We're, you know, this is this is not, you know, this is a little too risky for us. So they decided to dissolve our group, which was insane. We had a great business. We had great relationships. We saw the upside. 
So Will Margoloff, who's you know one of my best friends, who was the head of um, the sales department at the time, came a bunch of us and he said, I think we could buy this ourselves. Like, why don't we convince them? We'll get some investors. None of us had a pot to piss him at the time, by the way. We were all in our late 20s. And um, okay, all right, we came up with some money. We got we convinced some friends to invest. And we bought this thing for a little over a million dollars. And we basically bought contracts and we had some assets and um, the AR. The AR was more than what we were paying for it. All we had to do was collect some money and we would break even. So for, for, for the first six months, we were selling collections. I was just calling people. But companies were defaulting AR. because- AR? Accounts Spoke. receivable. Right. We just want people Accounts to receivable. Collecting money from what people owed you. So I would be basically an, a, you know, a collector. <laughs> that wasn't my job. We got on the phone and tried to collect and we collected more than what we paid for the company. So we're already ahead of the game. An Italian so, guy that collects, go figure that one out. <laughs> How did you fit into that? Uh, I don't know. A, a six foot two. I made two, him an offer they couldn't six refuse. Three, <laughs> six yeah. foot two. How tall are you? How tall? Six two. Six two Italian guy that's in the collections. Huh? Did you tell no, him what you, nickname? You look at a trendsetter. <laughs> What's your nickname? Um, and nickname. What is my nickname, Tony? You're a big Tony to, to us. <laughs> That's right. Big Tony. Well, I'm, I'm a little less big Tony because I just lost He's 30 pounds. Tony. He's slim Tony <laughs> I was now. bigger Tony. He's lean Tony. So when you say you bought it, who, you're buying it from yourself? Who are you buying it from? No, no. So, so IDT owned us, uh, Netophone, and they decided to dissolve the company. So we were like, well, we'll pay for this, but we want you know assets. We want the AR, and we'll, you know, we come up with a number. So you bought it from and, IDT? Yes. So we bought this Netophone, Got and it. the Mail.com came with it because remember, mm -hmm. that was part of the deal. So um, we had that business for um, a few years. We started building it up. And then we acquired this tiny little agency at the time in Atlanta called 360i. They had like you know, 30, 35 people. And they just did regional southeast you know, SEO, which is search engine optimization and search optimization. And that was a business at the time. And uh, this little agency, 360i, that we bought, and we took that on, and we started building that up, and we started building the business we had with the Netophone and, the, and the, mostly the Mail.com. We, we, and in 2005, we got bought by a Japanese portal company from Japan and um, for over $110 million. Ooh, you guys, you guys doing some math on So that? it was a 100-timer. I don't think you ever have a 100-timer again. 100x. The only problem is we didn't have a pot to piss in, so, you know, like, you know. <laughs> Every dollar was 10 times, okay? Wow. <laughs> I'm sorry, 100 times. Every dollar, one dollar equal 100. So, you know, do the math. Um, I wish I had more money at the time. I remember going in to ask my, my father, who was, um, think of a Sebastian Maniscalco, if you know, and he, they talk about his father. There's a movie coming out. That's kind of my father, okay? Right. <laughs> Off the boat, Italian. And I remember going in to see my father, and I said, Dad, can you just, you know, can I borrow fifty thousand dollars? And he had the money, by the way. He's a successful he guy, very of successful. He, did. he make it a pizza. And then it's in, it was in an Italian accent. And he had just um, invested in AOL on the stock, and the thing just plummeted right at the time. And he's like, "I'm not gonna get involved in this internet with you. You're crazy." And he would say, "Internet." He would say, "Internet." <laughs> And uh, he, th he literally threw me out of the house. I mean, he threw me out. And I'm like, God. I mean, I knew I took it to the limit there. I'm like, I tried my best. Now we look back like, Dad, that 50000 yeah. worth $5 million. Oh, <laughs> man, boy. So but, what did you initially put in? Uh, oh, not too much. <laughs> he, uh, he, around, he, that he, around that amount. You gave what you Around had. that amount. That's yes. all right. Yeah, you uh, gave which was had. good, which is great. By the way, all of a sudden, you know, I had millions. Um, for a young guy, it was great. And then uh, a very fortuitous thing happened. So the company that bought us, uh, the members of the board and the CEO went, got put in jail for a problem they had with um, finances through the stock uh, exchange in Nikkei in Japan. And uh, the board got cleared out. We had a two year earn out. Um, I think it was like 80% up front and two year earn out. And during that two years, no one, because it was a board change, they kind of just ignored us. So two years is up. We get paid in full. We blew out our numbers, literally blew them away. We get paid in full. And we're like, these guys don't even know what we do. And it's a whole new board. No one's married to it. No one's loyal to it. 
So I think it was Will who came up, Margolov, who came up with this idea, and he's like, let's just buy, buy it, it again. <laughs> wow. And, like, well, and we're like, well, uh, why would they sell it to us? He's like, we'll just tell them we're going to leave. They don't even know how to operate their business. Oh. So I said, hey, you know what? We want to buy back you know, for 25 cents on a dollar. Like, are you nuts? This is a fledging business. We're like, but we're all going to leave and the company's going to implode. So they were like, screw you. We're, we're going we're gonna to find a buyer. So buyers will come in. And of course, they're going to interview. You guys. What are you guys doing? Well, we're leaving. Wow. So they were forced to sell it back to us. I think it was like 30 something cents on the dollar. What? So now, so now we made a, you made a killing and now we have money and we have more skin in the game now. Okay. Because so it was a hundred million dollar buy a, a million over, dollar. Over yeah. a, a million, million? Basically a million dollar investment over a hundred million dollar. And then buy. when you bought it back, it was 30 cents on the dollar. The dollar of, let's say that's still valuation. 30 something million back. So yeah. So that just for. real easy math, but that's so great. Yeah, what a great. It was an amazing opportunity at the time so now we all had some money in our pockets we bought a couple things and and we invest all have money now to really invest to make Mm -hmm. to take the company now to the next level and we did that we made some acquisitions um really cool acquisitions um company in europe we bought called uh, net mining which we're able to like track a behavior what you were doing on a site and have like ai intent to figure out if you were going to make a purchase so we can and we can target that 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 consumer based on what we thought they were going to buy, which is pretty cool. Wow. It's just based on behavior, time sure. on site, how many times you come back to look at a product. You know, you're coming in to look at the widget. You went back five times in the last hour. You're probably going to buy that product. It's sitting in your cart. Let's hit them hard. Right. You know, and versus we, we versus someone now, who's yeah. not really interested. Why are we going to waste an ad on that person? So that was the premise on that. And then we had this fledging agency called 360i 360i became was a search agency that grew and we became we fell into social marketing we became the biggest social marketing agency in the world at the time this is like we're talking about 2009 2010 around that that time in fact there was this famous thing that we did in 2013 um remember the super bowl when the lights went out yes oreo was our client and uh we were doing on. Uh, we were doing social at the time during the game because that commercial was running. We were pushing out content, but they came up with an idea. Someone in our staff came up with an idea of dunk in the dark. Oh. I don't know if anyone remembers that. Wow! And they and we literally had to go up. The you know the call was made. They went to the Oreo marketing team. It came back and we released dunk in the dark. Dunk in the dark, and it became you know so wildly successful. Like right on the spot, you know, being spontaneous, and the agency took a lot of you know notoriety on that. Um, but what ultimately happened is in 2010, we sold the company to another Japanese company, Densu Holdings, which is a huge um, advertising holding company, who owns tons of agencies. Um, and they bought it uh, from us to about around $275 million. What a journey you've been on, huh? So that was, wow. that was great. All of a wow. sudden, we don't worry about the movie that he failed on. <laughs> We, we, we didn't come yet. We felt, I feel we, bad now. Now we didn't come yet. We felt sorry for it. Now, like, wait a second. Someone get a calculator. Um, and then what happened was uh, they bought uh, an agency, which was 360i. I told you we had this net mining product. So it was a, an agency, a technology, and a kind of like uh, just figure it as an, we call it an ad network. Okay. They did different things. The, the outside the agency, it was kind of a conflict of interest at the time. Denso didn't really know what they had of, of the other two pieces because we were kind of selling to their competitors. So again, the brainstorming happened. Like, why don't we buy those two pieces and peel away? So half of our uh, people stayed. Um, one of our great partners at the time, um, uh, Brian Wiener and Sarah Hofstetter, they were with us on that journey, most of that journey. They stayed at 360i. Will, Eric Bamberger, and I and others peeled away, and then we bought the company from Denso. Wow. You know what? Uh, I'm sorry. I want to stop you here. So wait, wait, how many times can you but, milk the same cow? Geez. Well, you you are. I was going to say you're, 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 you are going back to the same well, mm-hmm. right, which is, which is fine. But there's two things that I, I recognize real clearly, and I hope the audience does as well. One it's alignment, okay, with the people, right? Alignment with your right people you can trust. And taking 
a, a risk, although it's calculated at this point after the first round, you can kind of get a better sense of what could happen, right? The possibilities. You, you know, you, you need to take uh, a risk on yourself. You need to, again, put that energy and effort in the right place with the right people. Because it's very rare that you would hear a story like this from an A individual, someone who's just self-proclaimed and done it on their own. Anthony will be the first one to admit, and he said it, whether you heard it or not, you know, he wasn't in the front leading the charge. You were listening, following, taking stock in guys like Will and Eric and said, okay, I'm positioned correctly here. Now just follow, you know, the strength in numbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where does, where does Zeta come in now? Okay. So we peel off in 2014 and we really built. You buy great, yourselves back. We buy ourselves back. For the same dollar We're, amount or more? Uh, for a lot less. Why? Uh, a lot less because we took only a, a component of the Because the 360 was, got, okay, the 360 got it, got it, got it. broke off. Yeah. We got, but this time we had like big banks investing. Yeah. You know, like, okay. you know, we, and we, again, bucked up again, uh, believes in ourselves. Um, company was called Ignition One. Uh, we kept the net mining brand too. We had these two brands. And we did great. We had some really great um, um, continuation of the relationships we had where we built on those. We had some big brands. Um, company, I think at one point we had 500 employees where we were, you know, we, we started out with 12 guys. We built it up to over 1,000 with, with 360 Identso. And then when we peeled off, we, we started out with like maybe 150 and built that up back to 500 people. And you so, kept the clients you had? Kept every client and started adding. We were global. We had offices around the world. And um, at the time, and around that time, there were problems going on in the industry where some companies were going out of business. And um, how it works with companies like us is that you know you you have your uh, your clients who need to pay you sometimes they don't pay you in six months but you have to pay your costs out front so you have a how to have a credit um partner in between where they give you little loans anyway there were a couple of companies in our industry that started defaulting so that the money got tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter to a point where something had to give so we needed help so enter uh zeta global which saved our asses. Okay, we had a great company, got great people, we got great clients, and um, you know, hmm. David Steinberg, being a brilliant entrepreneur that he is, saw company assets in us that were really uh, of value, and um, hmm. and then we became part of that that company, and uh, well, most of the same guys, all the great people stayed because it was a great company, and all the yeah riff raff where we probably had a you know cut left. Uh, but Zeta's smart. They know how to keep the right people. And um, and it's been amazing since. So from 2019 to now, um, that's where I am. So I'm with the same wow. group of guys. I mean, literally the same core since, you know, I haven't interviewed for a job since 1999. <laughs> that's amazing. And now, so Zeta acquires you in 2019? 2019, yeah. Got it. But, you know, again, what, what John was saying is you, you, you can have the greatest ideas in the world. And lots of companies do. What I've learned, it's the people. The people are most important by far. You could have a mediocre idea and have a great team of people, and it's going to go somewhere. You can have the greatest idea with a mediocre, and it could fall. Yeah, people are the most competitive advantage and you can find. That's what you invest in. Yep. You invest in people, not just ideas. Mm. And then the other thing is, you think about people always ask us, how did you guys stay together for so long? Because we learned how to complement each other rather than overstep each other. Everybody knew their lanes. You know, I'm not great at everything. Will's not great at everything. Eric's not great at everything. The other, you know, we had Chris Hansen, this other great entrepreneur that was with us. We all weren't great at everything, but we knew where we could complement each other. The things I was great at that they weren't at, I helped them. But the things I sucked at, Okay, they helped me on, and we all fit in like a piece, like a puzzle, and we all respected each other, um, and that's how we were able to stay together. Um, you know, because you're you're in the fight. I mean, when you're an owner of a business, working twenty four seven. You know, I'm working twenty hour days. I'm working on weekends. This is why you know you know my man became a loser in the house because I'm working so much, and they're not paying attention enough to my family, especially when you're younger and you're trying to build yourself. 
But you got to sweat it out. You got to take the risk. You got to put the time in. You're not going to get anywhere unless you, you, you do all those things. Scream it loud. Top of the mountains. Again, That's from right. a guy who's climbed up the mountain and sits today in a position that I would say is uh, looking over and, and certainly reaping the benefits of a lot of hard work. Yep. So we're going to just take a break and, and come back and wrap things up with Anthony Martinelli on the uh, Johnny Drinks podcast. A few moments later. Three, two, one, back. So, Anthony, you, you mentioned working with a team. I think that's super important to be cohesive. What are you great at? I know you said there's things that everybody else is good at and you're not so good at things, but what are your, like, what are your day-to-day -day roles, I guess? Collects money. <laughs> Collects money. I'm a people person. I'm a problem solver. Um, I think I'm really good at being spontaneous and being able to pivot and not staying in the lanes. Um, and you're a good those friend. Those are the things I'm really good you're at. You're a good friend. You are a good friend. I, I try to be every day. You, <laughs> you are. Yeah. Well, it pays to have good friends back. There you so. go. Well, what are you, what are your have your day to day roles changed since being acquired by Zeta? Um, fun. Well, yeah, day to day. You know, my 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 job has expanded where I have you know very high level um, clientele where it's it just keeps on growing because it. You know, the business name helps. And then my former relationships lead to new relationships. So that's greatly expanded, I think, in the last three or four years where, you know, there's a few, only one or two holding companies I was really dealing with. And now it's most of them. And um, they're really brilliant people working at these companies. When I'm, That's why I love my job where I'm engaging with, you know, you know, great, great clients, great, and who become friends, like real friends. Like, like the greatest thing about my job is that you get to meet people every day. And, you know, 99% are, you know, business acquaintances, but that, you know, maybe even half percent or less than half percent become, wait a minute, I can hang out with that person. Yeah. And then you have these amazing relationships that last the rest of your life, you know, which is pretty amazing. What is your day-to-day? -day? My day-to-day -day is I lead a team dealing with high-level contracts with these holding companies. I mentioned Densu, there's Densu, there's Publicis, there's WPP, there's Omnicom, you know, to name a few. And um, uh, our team sets these uh, contracts up these throughout these holding companies where, you know, we give um, some benefits based on volume on, uh, on, on, uh, on being able to provide services um, and solutions for them. So um, there's a lot of weaving in and out to get, you know, there's a lot of competition out there, you know, you know and um, we have to really present ourselves uh and be able to articulate you know what our value prop is and have the right people to do that and then at the end of the day we have to perform when you actually mm. you get a deal in you have to perform you have to do your job and that's that's when it gets you know like that's when you you can actually start growing your business and that's that's and you have to have the right people to do that it's not just the right technology there's a lot of ai and there's a lot of automation we have but you have the right communication even just follow up it's just so important like, you know, I teach the people that, you know, they've, they've worked with through the years younger than me. I'm like, you get an email and you know the answer and then you'll sit there and like, and you <laughs> wait six hours to get back to them. And the person's sitting there and be like, did they get my email? Just to respond and say, got it, confirming receipt, get back to you at three o'clock. And at three o'clock, if you don't have the answer, hey, I know it's three o'clock, I'll get back to you tomorrow morning. But the little things like that put you above. And, um, you know, that's part of what makes a great company is the people. And you've drilled that into your employees. Yeah, definitely. And then, you know, you learn, you learn, you learn to throw it, right? You know, experience is what, what gets you to, you know, where you're going to go. And you have to have the right mentors, you know, to do that. People willing to take the time. Um, you know, it's important. I'm, I'm luckily I've had some great mentors in my life. And, um, you know, that's really, that's really important. You know, and when, people, when someone takes you under their wing, um, consider that special and don't, take that for granted, mm. whether it be a coworker or an uncle or your father or your mother or your aunt or your, you know, a friend, um, you know, someone who's been through it and, and being a mentor, I think is important to latch on to. And you're saying that from both ends, you have mentors and mentees yeah, right now. Definitely. You know, Everyone I have, I have, I have people who call me their mentors. I'm very flattered by that. And I didn't even think I was, but you know, <laughs> like you've been a mentor to me. I'm like, I have I'm like, and they'll point out five. I'm like, I guess, I guess so. Everyone should be a mentor but I've had and a protege, yeah. right? Yeah. I'm sure your dad is a great mentor to you. Yeah. 
I mean, oh, really? Let's go deeper. Let's go deeper <laughs> with this. Please talk more about that. Yeah. yeah. Um, how many, how many people are you managing personally? Uh, personally, I have four. And then there's, if you really want to dot lines, it's, you know, almost a hundred people dotted though. You know, there's other groups. It's, it's a complicated thing, but no, no, uh, leader should have probably more than eight reporting mm. to them at one time. That's a good point. Because then you start needing levels because that's too much to manage. Right. A direct report. You know, you're, you're right. A direct right. report. Right. Right. I think eight is probably the right number uh, with a max number. Anything more than eight, it starts to get a little convoluted. That's when you start needing another layer. Between four and eight is probably great. You know, great balance. So and right now I'm at four. I'll probably end up, you know, with a couple more in the next year or two. Do you ever get those four together? All the time. All the time. Yeah, we're always, you know, texting and. You know, there's formal meetings, but we're always like, you know, riffing on each other and, you know, you have teams and, you know, we're, we're always in contact. Our our business is, I would like to say, it's almost 24 7 because there's always things going on. It's different time, too, time yeah. zones. And, you know, you know what's interesting about your business? As deep as deep gets in technology as this business is, I am so impressed with how it is boots on the ground, press the flesh. Meetings, face to face, dinners, time, time that is invested. Then, and, and to his point, um, it is a, a we've su- taken you on on a bunch. Yeah, and you've seen yeah. it, and, I, and that's <laughs> what that's Anthony. That is probably one of the greater things that I enjoy. That you not only have fun, but you're surrounding yourself with the like minded people that want to accomplish the same goals, and everyone is cohesive. You have people you sit down and play golf with, and at tables with their Co- competitors, like true competitors of one another, yet they do one thing a little different, so they complement one another. That does not happen everywhere. I don't know, actually, anywhere, any other industry it happens that ha- happens in. Um, maybe a little bit in now the space, the liquor space. I see a lot of distilleries that have each other's back and they use each other's for for technology and experience. And sometimes if they need uh, grain or they need some sort of product, they help each other out. But this is old school meeting new world and um it's just impressive to to watch unfold really and also you know with changing times there's nothing nothing like a face-to-face nothing people still relate to people and it's harder to do on a screen and we actually you know because you're a lot more formal on the screen where here you know it's like you're in you know, you're together in a pretty, like if we were doing this, it, you just don't have the interaction, mm. the body language, mm-hmm. but just to be able to like kind of go off script, you know, in any situation you have and start to really get to know someone, you know, people want to do business with people they like and trust. It's hard to do that, you know, on a screen. How do you get to know somebody, you know? And, you know, that's how, that's where the trust level comes in, you know? Did you know, you, you bring up a, a- unbelievably important point and a valid point, which is, so if we're on a Zoom call together and I have something that crosses my mind as a question, I may not interrupt you and probably won't interrupt you because you're going to still talk. And yet then something else happens and I I lost my opportunity to ask the question. If I'm face to face, I can say, well, wait a second, can you back up? You know, can you, you're not going to do that on a Zoom call. It feels rushed. Because, right, there's a time limit and there's other people and maybe the, the, the dynamic is such that you're a little embarrassed. You say, oh, I don't want to ask that question. Maybe someone will answer it for me, right? So face-to-face yep. is so invaluable. And I think a lot of younger people that listen to you say that are going to argue the point and say, no, I'm just as effective. And I that's how we do it. We text, we short bursts, and, and we get a lot done the, the, with the benefit of technology. It's funny how you talk about younger people. So I have, you know, younger nieces and nephews and they, they ask me like, you know, what could I do to like be a cut above and not to be um, that critical, but just to speak reality. It, it, it's come down to <laughs> you. If you do the basics right now, you're above. <laughs> I mean, it's so true. <laughs> come in a little early. That's a huge, you know, instead of on time or, you know, go to your boss and just ask, you know, What else can I do for you? You know, write a handwritten note instead of just some text. You know, Um, it's just it's the basic little things that used to be the norm that it's not done anymore. If you just take that extra time, you will rise above the crop. I mean, you will really rise. You know, Um, 
be more um, punctual. Punctual about that. Just be more uh, 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 social beyond the screen. You know what I mean? Like, you know, uh, take your boss out to lunch. You know, like it, these sound like old fashioned things, but this <laughs> because you know what? Out of the hundred people, there might be two people taking your boss out to lunch. Okay, because the other people aren't thinking about it anymore. Yeah. Okay, just do the basics, and you will be that much better. It's just incredible what it's come down to. <laughs> so, yeah. what do you, what do you, do you think have employees stand out like that too? What's that? Do you have younger employees that stand out like that too? Yes, I mean, I've had. I've had it's funny the other day, uh, someone came up. She's more of an established employee. She's new. I mean, mm-hmm. she's been here a while. I don't know if you guys watch Ted Lasso, but in sure. Ted Lasso, you know, he comes in with a little. Someone came the, in the other day and handed me a little box with a little cookie thing in there. And I'm like, I'm not going to forget this. I went home. I told my wife and I told my family. I'm like, yeah, I believe this new employee came in. And, and it wasn't corny. It made her memorable. I'll never, I'll, I'll remember that. I told, I'm supposed to tell the story. I'm telling the story now. <laughs> <laughs> like, just, you know, just yep. do above, you know, what normally you think you should be doing. And mm-hmm. um, you really go. You know, so when you up. hear that, what do you think personally? Because we've had similar conversations. Similar conversations. I think there's a lot had, of people feeling which is, now, if you have an option, you know, if you have an option, I've said this to him and we did one podcast, you have an option between a face-to-face meeting or a Zoom call. Which one is it? If you have uh, an opportunity between a, an email or a text, which one? Pick so, up the phone. Yeah. Pick up the phone. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, it sounds like, oh, here's the corny old guy. No, it's not. I mean, like interaction. This is, this is, but look, I saw your, um, I watch your stuff. You're cool. talking about working from home and I think one of your mm-hmm. podcasts. Yeah. I think there's a balance. Okay. There's two sides. Should we all be working from home? Should we be in the office? I think you need both. And I'll mm-hmm. tell you why. When you're in the office, it's great. Great interaction. Okay. But I can't but tell you how many times I'm in the office where like, I'm saying hello to Sally and I'm saying hello to Bob and I'm mm-hmm. saying hello to Jane. And all of a sudden I'm looking at my dad and I'm like, I probably wasted an hour and a half of <laughs> little, you know, where at home I could have been like commuting, yeah. rocking through like my day, you know? And, you know, there's someone came in, we had the office full and they're like, I'm looking for so and so. And I'm like, I can't find him for the last hour. And I'm like, if we were all home, I bet you find him in two seconds. So there are some of the benefits sure. of working from home. There, there are days that when I'm working from home, I can roll through, I can end the meeting at, you know, 3.59 and be at the meeting next meeting at 4 where mm-hmm. if you're in the office, you're bouncing around between conference rooms, you're late to meetings, the tech's not working right because you're sitting in a room and you got to call the IT guy. I mean, there's a lot of inefficiencies, but to have that face-to-face is is so valuable. So there, I think there's a balance. There's a couple of days a week where you can really get a lot of work done from home, but then you should be in the office, you know, on well, a couple that's, of days as well. We, and I think, I think that's where the world it should go right. to. It's, it's not an either-or. And you just have to know what kind of business you're in and whatever. You know, with me, with my salespeople, I just want them to be in front of their customers. They don't have right. to be in the office. Just be in front of their customers, you know, be interacting. Yeah. I was going to say that sales especially, like if you're trying to convince somebody to do something, whether it's buy or whatever, being in person, you're going to have a better chance of mm-hmm. doing that. Mm-hmm. Right. Like you and I just discussed, we're supposed to meet with some guys or they said, can you meet? And we couldn't meet at the time that they could meet this week. So he is going to try to be available when I they, be available. yeah, I mean, yeah. hopefully they're still available, but if that wouldn't, wasn't laid out for either one of us to meet them, they would jump right to a zoom call and I wouldn't even be really be able to participate on it. Right. Yeah. So pump the brakes and say, well, if we, if we, especially the first, this would be the first meeting. I wouldn't. I, I've never met them. You haven't. Oh, well, that's my point. So I've never met these guys and yet we're, potentially going to line up for a very long-term relationship, putting aside the deal, it's a relationship. And so I defer like you back to um, that holds a lot of stock and a lot of value because I want to see body language. I want to see how you interact. I want to see how you, uh, honestly, after your first cocktail, what kind of person you are. Those things matter. And don't think for a second, someone else isn't trying to do the same thing to evaluate, well, am I going to invest in these guys? Are these the right kind of people? So yeah, a lot to, to consider um, about the value of meeting face to face. Yeah, totally. Um, I brought this guitar here. because Where told is me it? To. Where? <laughs> Wait, <laughs> oh, I told you here. to? The conversation started. Listen, the I'll only do the, thing that was planned uh, was, he goes, I'll do the podcast. He goes, why don't I'm, you bring, why don't you bring your guitar? Well, so basically, with me. You, and um, I mean, but Don, 
talked about, I, I was in a band my whole life. You know, I always loved music, cover band. I wanted to be a rock star. And, uh, you know, by the time you're in your late teens after college, you figure out you got to devote your whole life to it, go into a career. But what I did was, you know, suit and tie during the week and you know, on weekends, mm. jamming in bars in Hoboken and the Hamptons and Jersey Shore. And I did it for many years. That networking was amazing. And that's uh, AKA and, meaning how you met the ladies networking. I mean, what I would love to do is give you guys a couple shakers and we'll do it like a little song. I'll give you guys oh. a couple shakers. You might have to take a break because oh. I think the shakers are out there. Yeah. Um, Let's do it. That was a gift. But this guitar, that's part, this guitar, by the way, it's a very special story. We talk about my mentor. My dad is my mentor. He's taught me so much, so much. From Italy, off the boat, came here in 1963, grew up on a farm in Italy, making wine and olive oil, uh, came to this country with my mother. My mother was six months pregnant at 20 years old, didn't know a word of English. Hmm. And he's made, I mean, I say he's a millionaire. Yeah. Met multimillionaire where he, he, he built uh, businesses and restaurants and he became a builder and amazing. But maybe he kicked you out of the house and he's still your mentor. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but um, you know he came. He came to this country and he became a, one of his first jobs in the early '60s. Was uh, he became a car, guitar craftsman, and uh, he gets to this company called Guild Guitars in Hoboken, which is right here. It's an amazing company, Guild Guitar. It still exists today, and um, they've moved though since they're not in Hoboken anymore. So he comes to this country, and um, it was actually a time where, as an immigrant, you're not just you know working in construction and doing, you know, landscaping jobs. There were manufacturing jobs, a lot of them, where my mother worked in a, in a sewing factory and my, di- my dad got a job uh, as a woodworker in his guitar company. And he knew how to dabble with wood and there were old Italians working there at the time in their 60s. And everybody was making the guitars, you know, handmade and, you know, take a lot of time. And my father saw all these amazing machines as a 20 year old that no one was using, these new machines. And think about today, mm. like it's the young generation who was like the cutting edge and who's moving, so he sees these machines, like why aren't these old guys using this? And he figured out a way within a couple months to turn eight necks a day carved per person to 24. Wow. So all of a sudden the owners in a company was like, oh, this guy's, this kid's amazing. And he taught the old guys how to use the machinery and he grew up in the company. Anyway, so 64 hits and it's the Beatles, Ed Sullivan, you know, and the guitar orders just were through the roof. So my father got the chain train a lot of people and he grew up in the company. So I had this little guitar in college and it got stolen. So I said to my father, one day I will find one of these guitars and that you made and hopefully I'll find one one day. So years later, we're talking about maybe 10 years ago, I started looking and my dad was there from 64 to 72. He was in, um, um, he was building them f- between 64 and 67 and repairs 67 to 72. Repairing for like famous people like John Denver and uh, Tommy Smothers and Richie Havens. He's got a good career there. And uh, so I started searching. I'll be on eBay. And this plate right here under the plate was where it was an archaic process where they would like put their initials on who made the carving That's, instead okay. of like a serial number or anything. But it does say Hoboken inside here, um, this guitar. So under this plate, it would have these initials. So I've been on eBay, and 99.9% of the time, his initials wouldn't be there. It would be someone else's or none. And a couple of times where I, I put a bid just to get the process going in, and I call the seller later. And this one time, I win the bid. The guitar comes. I spent thousands on this guitar. I take the plate off. His initials aren't there. So I, mm. now I finally, I want to surprise my father. I tell him the story. He's like, that's a 1970. It was 64 to 67 I was making them. You're you're looking in the repair years. You got to narrow your search down. I'm like, I didn't even uh. think of that. So a couple of years go by, same thing happens. I put a bid on this guitar and uh, I forget, I didn't call that, I win the bid. I'm like, shit, guitar comes in again. <laughs> like now we have two of these things. So, um, there you go. So uh, my father's over for dinner, the night it arrives. And I tell him, telling him the story, he goes, you wasted your money. My, by the way, in my father's eyes, I waste my money all the time. <laughs> you wasted your money again. Like, you know what the long shot is? I'm like, he's like, where is it? I'm like, it's in a box. He takes the box out. You look at it. He grabs his guitar. He's like, this is a 67. I'm like, how did you know? He goes, I could tell by the neck. I was like floored that 
I'm like, wow. I'm like, Dad, you really are embellishing when you tell these stories. But uh, we get the screwdriver out, and uh, he takes the screws off. We pull the plate out, and we see M.M. Michael Martinelli. Wow. And I was like, wow, it was meant to be. And this is the way it happened. So he's holding this guitar, and he's like, I was tearing up. And my dad's not a tear up kind of guy. And he's like, 50 years ago, this guitar was a piece of wood, and it went through probably the whole world, and it's back in my hands. So it actually works out great because the one first one I bought is the one I drag around and play everywhere. And this one I only bring out for special occasions because this is the one he made. Mm. So this is going to like become a fairly family heirloom. This is a great special story. occasion, huh? So you want to go get your shakers? Yeah, so yeah. You guys can help me? Yep. I will. Wait. Great. Are we going to play a song? You guys are going to be the percussion. Hold on. I'll get two shakers. And well, uh, so I, while I'm on this break here... Um, you know, I, I don't play music as much as I used to. Now I've become a roadie for my son mm. uh, who writes some songs. And uh, I have to plug him because I'm on here. He's on Spotify. He's on uh, Anthony Martinelli. Yep. There you Same go. name as me. Anthony Martinelli. He's been writing Spotify. songs. He's got a song called Late July and Worth It right on, on Spotify, Apple Music, all streaming services. And he has uh, a couple new songs coming out in the next week or two. Okay. And I become his roadie. Love that. So that's my job now. I just tune his good guitar and make sure he's good. But he's 16 years old, and uh, how is he? He's. I think he's amazing. He's pretty. I'm pretty proud of him. He that's writes great. all his own music, and they have meaningful lyrics, kind of an Ed Sheeran meets Harry Styles kind of vibe. Good. But he has a band too, and he plays rockers. And um, so he's been using this guitar a lot. And he's recording with us right now. So that's awesome. Um, it's a little, a little different over right here. So, uh, Johnny, Johnny, grab my uh, case. What? Is Johnny grabbing my case? I think he's show? grabbing it, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, we're in tune. Okay, so what I need you to do is, can you, did you ever work a shaker before? You know, a little egg shaker? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you hold it up to your ear, and you get a little vibe going, and a little shaker, and you get a little rhythm going, and then we'll... Uh, Go right into it. All right, I think I can handle that. Yeah, you know, a little music. You know, do you guys have a theme song yet? Mm, like, you know, here's Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like that, but we do have we do have one. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, we have like a little. I would say what's like fifty jazz type of style. Yeah, yeah we try to emulate the Frank Sinatra vibes. I love the Frank jazz. Sinatra jazz. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to get my son into Frank Sinatra. Is that it's a, hard to get. I try to think about when I, you know, I was just exposed to it through my family, and I think it just hit me. I think maybe after college, like, wow, he is really that talented. It only hit me a couple years ago. Yeah, you know, when we do this stuff. Yeah, it's it's hard it's to slow. It's yeah, but if you, as a singer, by the way, if you really appreciate how he phrases and what he does with his voice, no one. The reason why he is Frank Sinatra is because no one could really do it as well as right, him. right, right. You know, and there's actually a great book called i recommend it to everyone out there who want to learn about life and Where's challenges it's called the way you wear your hat it's okay. about sinatra it's about how he's lived his life and how he took charge of his life the way you wear your hat amazing book wait, wait. Um, got you. You, you no not that. those shakers all right you could do it it's yeah Johnny let's try it that way it's Johnny okay Trace. can you go all right, so the, you didn't, he got to, he got. A I shakers. actually got egg shakers for you, but it's he okay. No, no. Right, if so you if you could actually do I, this, I this would be amazing. I'm never. Even, okay, so so do you know how to keep a rhythm? So I need you. To go. How are you shake with this? All right, it's a Beatles song. I just seen a face, I can't forget the time or place where we just met. She's just a girl for me. I want all the world to see we've met. I had it been another day, I might have looked the other way, but I would never have been aware. But as it is, I'll dream of her tonight. Falling, yes, I'm falling, and she keeps calling me back again. Oh, falling, 
Yes, I'm falling. And she keeps calling me back again. One more time. All right. Falling. Yes, I'm falling. And she keeps calling me back again. My man. This is why we brought this guy. Wow. You guys are awesome. <laughs> You're the best. Hell yeah. I mean, talk about wow. improv. I mean, Jeez. you guys are wow, listen, anyway, I can't. You know, you know, well, you anyone can join next time we play. You guys can be I'm the in. percussion guys. I got to get ready for con. I got to teach the bartenders doing some bars while the bands play. That, that was a business. That I was can't. awesome. <laughs> yeah, I'm ready. Well, I think that's I think that's it for the day. How how else are we going to end this? That's that's the best way to end. I think we're going to ask him two questions like we do. Oh, I mean, it's kind of Oh, it's never sort of mind. It's only we only ask the two questions when he wants to ask the two questions. Then ask the two questions if you'd like to. Nope, it's your it's your show. I'm just well. I actually I thought it was, was your show. This yeah, one. this was. I was the so host. Then ask your questions. It. So we try to ask, try because we do it. I think consistently, maybe not every time. Uh, the most humbling experience in your life, and the most successful experience in your life. Wow. Yeah, this is where it gets deep. Uh, the most successful experience in my life is I was at a gig with my cover band, and I wasn't supposed to be Wait, there. Wait, can you just talk? Uh, oh, I was a gig. Um, thinking <laughs> uh, with my cover band, and um, I was at a gig I didn't want to be at. I wasn't supposed to be at, and it was the night I met my wife. Nice, go on. It's the most successful, <laughs> uh, poignant, best timing. Uh, I don't think she ever would have talked to me if I wasn't in the band. Um, <laughs> I don't even think, yeah, no way. <laughs> uh, humbling. Wow. There's been a lot of those. Uh, I've, wow. I'm godfather to, I think, eight godchildren. And only a couple through family. And I have such dear friends who give me that honor. I think it's amazing. I'm pretty humbled when someone's come to me and said, you know, I want you to be godfather or best man. Um, I think it's touching and I'm lucky to have amazing friends and you're, you guys oh. are, I mean, Johnny's one of them. Definitely. My man. Awesome. Well, thank you. Yeah. And actually, we can't let you leave until you give us your, okay. you were so anxious I, I, at the I, beginning. I, we almost I, forgot. My, my that was the best. That was the best gift, by the way. It, just singing like that. They didn't know they were gonna do that. <laughs> Impromptu. Uh, that thing falls. Okay, so there's a couple things. I, I didn't really know what to get you. It was a it was a ball here. A golf ball? Okay, no, no, it's oh. one of them. Oh. So uh, you said to bring something, and of course I didn't really read the whole email um, until last night. And there were three things. So you call me Big Tony. And um, I just got this as a gift, and I thought this was kind of funny. This is a Big Tony golf ball. Oh. This is Big Tony on here, so you know you can hopefully you will use that. Like oh yeah. Okay. The other thing is, um, do you guys know this? TX is one of my. It's not an expensive whiskey. I just really like it. Each hide on top is a unique hide from a bootmaker in uh, Fort Worth, Texas. That's awesome. And I found out about this. I had some time to burn a couple of years ago, and I went in to get cowboy boots, and I didn't realize it's like buying a car. Yeah. And, I, and uh, it was a whole process. And he said, "You want? Would you like something to drink?" And I tried this, and I thought it's just really smooth and everything. And each uh, is a hide, a unique hide on this. And I just uh, not too many people know about this. Cool. So thank I figured you. I'd introduce it. Oh, you know, thank you. It has a, thank a you, great Tony. caramel vanilla taste to it. If you All like right. that. All right. And finally, this is the one. Um, I thought of so to me my my most important thing are my relationships my family of course um, my friends and uh, a bunch of years ago I made this wine called the four dons okay four of us made this and it's not really about the wine it was about making the wine and the friendships I have and just putting this together and on the back of this label there's um, my good friend Charlie Camara we call him Carlo Dave Penske and my dad and me and there's a little story about how we made the wine and what we did and the That's love great. that went into it and there's some pictures here and there's four dons here and it says uh, from the earth to your wine glass the four dons offer you a taste that you can't refuse <laughs> i love it so uh i love it it's about Thank friendship you. it's about friendship so, cherish it so much 
thank you very much. And, you know, this is what we, we ask of each of our uh, guests to bring something so we can remember and cherish. And the uh, wall has pictures and there's items placed in and around the podcast room. So this is special. I think this one, though, we have to drink. I don't think we're going to just display this one. I think I could display the, the, the golf labels ball. better than the actual one. Well, maybe I, so. Maybe I so. Do I use the golf ball to remember you I, with I a hole in one? Use the golf ball. Make it a hole in one. You could you could drink that. The label's right. kind of. I like the label. I'm pretty proud of yeah, that. It's label. cool. Sick. All right, so we'll display it. We'll display this. How's that? That's cool. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, okay. Anthony. You're the it's man. Been an honor. Thank you, you delivered. Thank you, you guys did, are amazing. You delivered. I didn't even know what to expect today, and this was you know. I was like, what am I going to talk about? <laughs> I'm glad you enjoyed. <laughs> Again, one of life's lessons: you yeah. show up, and things happen. Yeah, so right. thank you again. Appreciate you. you guys Love you. Thanks for watching. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers.